Welcome to Grace Church. We're glad that you could join us and connect with our church here. For the best online experience, go ahead and download the Grace Church app. From there, you can take notes, find the Bible, and fill out a response card. You can also find all of our past messages there in case you want to watch, rewatch, or share. Grace Church Online is made possible by faithful and generous people just like you. If you'd like to contribute to the work and ministry of Grace Church, you can do that through the app or at worcestergrace.org. The service will begin shortly, so stand by. Let's go to some historical facts about Thanksgiving. Okay. When was the first Thanksgiving? Whenever the pilgrims came along. In 1995? 1995 is close, but I think it might have been a little earlier. That was after I was born, so I know for a fact that it probably was before. When do you think the first Thanksgiving was? 1621. That's right. Do you know which president made Thanksgiving a holiday? I think it's Sunday. President Sunday. So Richard Nixon? Abe Lincoln. Abe Lincoln, correct. <laughs> what are you most thankful for? Life. You guys are much better than me. You're just better people. Family. I'm thankful for Santa. Food. I'm thankful for family and friends. Water. Um, the trees. Thankful for the trees? No, actually the lights. You're thankful for the trees and the lights? What's your favorite holiday? Christmas? Yeah, me too. I had a feeling you might say that. Well, good morning and welcome again to Grace Church. I'm glad that you're here. Today is the wrap-up of our series on prayer. And of course, this week is Thanksgiving. So I want to say happy Thanksgiving from us to you and your family. I hope your Thanksgiving celebration is wonderful. And I wonder today what you like most about Thanksgiving. Uh, maybe you like the fact that you get a couple days off of work or off of school, right? And so you're like, man, I love just the vacation aspect of it, the time off from the routine and kind of just enjoy each other's company. Maybe you like the family and you're with your family and your close loved ones and you're near them and so you enjoy that. Or maybe it's football. For you, you're like, yeah, there's a lot of football on, and I love watching football, and so it's all about the football. Or maybe, maybe you like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. You know, I've never really watched it. I think it's awful, but uh, this year I will because the Ohio State Marching Band is in the Macy's Parade, so I'll be watching that this year. Uh, but there's really one thing that uh, it kind of jumps out, and it's the thing that brings us all together about Thanksgiving, the thing that we all like. Do you know what it is? The food, that's exactly right, the food. And so what I thought we would do this morning is kind of do a poll so that you can know the people that you're sitting around a little bit better and kind of determine uh, different preferences as it relates to the Thanksgiving meal. But what I need from you is I need some participation, okay? So are you ready? Yeah. Okay, that's not very convincing. Are you ready? <laughs> Okay, good. So what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, a, a lot of things have changed in the Thanksgiving meal since 1621, right, the first Thanksgiving. A lot of things have changed, but the one thing that remains the same is the meal. And if you were going to do like an icon for Thanksgiving, it'd probably be a table, right? A table with, it's just like decked out with a whole bunch of food. And so let, let's talk about the food and let's start with the side dishes, okay? We got ourselves some sweet potatoes, we got some Brussels sprouts, we got some cranberries, and we got the corn casserole or whatever corn dish that you like, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're to find out what people like. So when I talk about the thing that you like or that's your preference, you let me know. Okay, how about the cranberries? Yeah, a few of you. Yeah, wow, that's exciting. How about the Brussels sprouts? Why? Why? Why, 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 right? This entire like angle, not so much me. How about the corn casserole? Yeah, yeah, that's good stuff. Or the sweet potatoes. Yeah, see, clearly this angle is way better than this angle uh, for Thanksgiving. That's what we're learning about the audience here this morning. Uh, but then you go from side dishes, and definitely the main dish is turkey. I don't really need to hear about your new modern idea of what Thanksgiving dinner should be. The traditional classic is turkey, right? I don't know if you're going to deep fry it or how you're going to make it and all that. But the deal is uh, some people like the, the white meat and some people like the dark meat, right? And so if you're a dark meat fan, let me hear you. Okay, or how about a, a white meat fan? It's just kind of split. Every hour has just been kind of split uh, down the middle. I'll be with the white uh, meat people here for this. But uh, there's one overlooked thing as it relates to the Thanksgiving meal that's super important. It doesn't really have to do with the food specifically, but it does have to do with the plates, okay? And so there's the divider people, and then there's the pilot on people, right? The people that are like, don't let my food touch. I can't have my cranberries touching the turkey. You know, and then there's people like, it's all going to the same place anyway, right? So how many people are divider people? Yeah? How many people are a pilot on? 
Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm probably more the divider thing. I go to places where I'm kind of like, wow, I don't even know what that is, and it needs its own section, right? Until I'm confident of it, I, it has to go there. And then finally, you wrap up the meal with a dessert, right? And there's the classic pumpkin pie, or there's the never should pumpkin be in a pie type people, right? So who likes pumpkin pie? Uh, who is like, uh, no way? Yeah, a few of you, right? Or maybe there's a few of us like me, like, I really don't like pumpkin pie, but that one time a year at Thanksgiving, there is a way to actually get it down. That's how you do pumpkin pie, right? Right there. The truth of the matter is, we have become very good at the meal, right? We like the meal. We do that well. We celebrate it. We knock it out. Everybody comes. People do a ton of work. We load up the table. Everybody eats, and then they fall into a food coma for a couple hours watching some football on TV, right? Uh, we do the meal well. But, of course we know, Thanksgiving is more than a meal, right? It's way more than a meal. George Washington in our country started this back in 1789, and then Abraham Lincoln had to restart it because we took a, a break from it for a while. And he declared this holiday, he said, Thanksgiving and praise belongs to our Father who dwelleth in the heavens. You think back on our heritage and you go, wait, the pilgrims, these people built seven times more graves than huts. And they paused to be thankful. It's kind of part of our DNA. And yet, I think that Thanksgiving, the holiday, is absolutely conflicted today. There's an attack on Thanksgiving. There's this season of greed that is crowding out Thanksgiving. I mean, the very day after Thanksgiving. Oh, wait. Actually, at about noon... On Thanksgiving, Black Friday starts. This entire push for more and more and more and more. And while it's not all that important what we, what we do on one particular day, it is a sad commentary, I think, on our soul about how unthankful and how ungrateful we are. Thanksgiving is more than a meal. It really is a mindset, isn't it? And we struggle with gratitude, and, and as this greed crowds out gratitude and pushes it away, we become less and less thankful all the time, and we justify it by saying, well, that's just a first world problem, and, and, and all of a sudden we start counting our problems more than we count our blessings. And if I was just going to keep it real today, I'd say we're way better at the meal than we are at the mindset. And I want to try to change that today. Really, it's God's idea that we would be thankful. He wants us to continually be thankful. As a matter of fact, it's his expectation that Thanksgiving would be more of a daily thing than a yearly thing. He wants us to kind of cultivate the idea of Thanksgiving every single day over and over and over and over and over again. Not something that we just pause to do one time a year. We need to do it more often than that. Being thankful is the fruit of of a lifestyle of prayer. If you're going to have a heart that's thankful, it's not about an action or a position where we fold our hands and close our eyes and bow our heads. And, and you might do that when you pray. But it's way more about your heart's position than your body's position. And humility and, and gratitude, those are key ingredients to have a thanksgiving mindset. And, and I'm going to kind of label that today. We're going to call it Thanksgiving Living. How do you cultivate the heart of thanksgiving living, the mindset, so that it's, so it's not just a season, but it's a, it's, a, it's a trait. So it's not just a list of things I'm thankful for. It comes out of a lifestyle of thanksgiving constantly. It sounds so basic, doesn't it? I mean, here you are at church the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and the guy's yakking about thanksgiving. Makes sense. So simple. But I don't think it is. We're not very good at being thankful. And being thankful is a character trait. And a character trait requires training and it requires discipline. And we have to get ourselves into the habit of doing that. Helen Keller said it this way, So much has been given to me that I have no time to ponder that which I don't have. Do you spend more time thinking about the things you don't have or the things that don't go your way, the things you wish you had, or the things that you do have? 
we'll call this the turkey day tension. And the Apostle Paul, he addressed the Thanksgiving tension in our hearts, not the, the annual celebration of the holiday, but the ongoing daily struggle that we have in our hearts. And his words are going to be our key this morning. He said this to the Thessalonians. He said, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Don't miss this. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Man, when the scripture says, this is God's will for you, he caught my attention. What is it? Three very clear expectations. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. God is clear that if you want to cultivate a thanksgiving, living kind of mindset, you're going to have to build these three expectations into your life. And it's going to take some training, and it's going to take some application of it. It's going to take some grit, if you will. And so with those three expectations this morning, I kind of want to slow down, walk through them together going into this holiday season. The first one is this, that we have to be pursuing constant joy. Constant joy. Now, the problem with this word joy is that we kind of compare it to the idea of happiness too often. And, and happiness is a good goal, but it's not the ultimate goal, and it's very different than joy. Joy and happiness are not the same. Now, some of you, you're chasing after what you maybe hope is joy, but it's actually happiness. You're going after different kinds of experiences. And they're not bad. Maybe you have a bucket list of things you want to do before you die. Like, I want to go travel here, I want to see this, I want to do that. That's good, you should have that list. I read on CNN that some of the most common ones are like riding with the bulls in Spain or taking a moto ride in Thailand or floating in the Dead Sea, right? Common bucket list ideas, things you got to do before you die. Maybe yours don't include those kind of experiences, but they're more like personal to your life. You know, like achievement, getting the degree, Getting the job, success, finding the relationship, starting a family, whatever those things are in your life that you want to achieve. And, and even more than that, things you want to experience. Now, we have so many things as a culture that we don't even really want to buy each other things anymore. We want to chase after experiences. Because we're trying to find happiness. None of those things are wrong, but they're not the same as joy. And there's a big difference. I'm going to give you a, an example that hopefully will stick with you for a long time about the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is like the experience at the amusement park at the end of the day. When all of your young children are crying and whining and complaining. They're tired, they're hot, it's been a full day, and you're on your way out. And then that one person jumps in front of them with all the glow sticks, right? And they see these glow sticks, and they have got to have these glow sticks. And at this point of the, of the experience, you are willing to give them your bank account and your social security number to get a glow stick, to hand it to your child, put a pacifier in their hand so that you can get to the parking lot, you know, without trouble. And so you buy these glow sticks, and you get to the parking lot, and you're in the car, and you strap them in, and you take off. And by the time you've left the premise of the amusement park, what's happened? The glow stick has died, Right? It was really bright and shiny at the beginning, and I got to have it, and I really need it, and I want it, and I want to chase after this. I got to have it, and then I get it, and then it, then it fades. That's happiness. Good in the moment doesn't last. Joy continues where happiness leaves off. Happiness has a short shelf life. Joy lasts forever. Paul told us, hey, listen, I want you to rejoice always, to always have joy, to always have joy. This is why it's important to know the distinction between joy and happiness, because you can't always have happiness, because life doesn't always go the way you want it to go. You don't always get what you want. And there's more to life than happiness. Joy is what transcends circumstances. I mean, is it, is it really possible to be joyful always? When you get the diagnosis you didn't want from the doctor? While you're waiting to get the diagnosis from the doctors? People tell me often that it's the waiting that's the worst part. You're supposed to be joyful then? During suffering or hardships or, hey, how about this one? We're walking into the holiday season here, right? 
Some of you this year, you've lost someone so important to you. And you're staring down the next five or six weeks, you're like, I just want to grit my teeth and get to January. Because it hurts. I'm supposed to be joyful in that? Rejoice always? See, happiness is a symptom of your situation, of your circumstances. Do you get it? You're happy. Joy is a product of your perspective. It doesn't have anything to do with your circumstances. It's like a drone. You know, it takes off from the ground and it, it shows you what you see around you, but then it goes up in the air and it gives you a perspective you can't see from the ground. I have a cousin that travels the world. He takes his drone everywhere he goes and he posts this stuff online. It's amazing the footage he comes up with. It's amazing what you can see from up here that you can't see from down here. Uh, joy comes from an elevated perspective. So where do you find that kind of perspective on life? How do you make sure you have the right view of life? Listen, you're never going to find true joy anywhere around you. It's not really going to be found in any relationship around you. It's not going to be found in anything around you. It's not going to be found in any experience around you. Joy, for real, is only found in Jesus. It's the only place you can find it. And he offers it to you because he gave his life and died so that you could live yours and have real joy. And many of you have already found that joy in a relationship with Jesus. And the thing that you're discovering is real joy that I've experienced because I know God personally and, and through Jesus. I can't keep that to myself. Joy never ends with me. It always spills over to somebody else. It gives back. Uh, Paul told the Philippians, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Joy spills over into other people's lives. That's why here at Grace Church, we have the value that saved people serve people, right? When, when we experience the saving grace of God, we give back that grace. When we have experienced the joy of knowing Jesus, it spills over into other people's lives. Uh, that's why last year we launched this Give Joy campaign uh, where together we did over 10,000 acts of meaningful kindness and joy to people in our community. And we want to relaunch that this year, headed into the holidays. And so I'm going to ask you this week, if you would just start to prayerfully consider how you can be giving joy in a very meaningful and tangible way to other people. You're going to hear more about it in the upcoming weeks. But if every person at Grace Church would do five, if you would give joy to five people, every person in our church, every child, every student, and every adult would give joy to five people before Christmas, we'd hit our 10,000. Just five people, but you got to be intentional. you got to be praying about it. Rejoice always. Constant joy cultivates Thanksgiving living. That's the first expectation that Paul gave. The second one, he said not only do you have to pursue constant joy, but you have to pursue constant prayer. Constant prayer. Constant prayer. Constant connection. Remember, since the beginning of this series, we've been saying praying is connecting with God. It's a relationship. Now, we understand a little bit about this in our world because we're constantly connected, right? We have a cell phone that tells us about constant connection. We have the ability to post and call and text people around the world in an instant. And there is a bad side to it, right? You, you know the story. You go out to dinner, and there's a family there, and they're all checking their phones, and none of them are talking. And so it's drop the eye contact thing and the relationships, and that's all true. Not trying to downplay that. But there's also an upside. The upside is you can see what your family members literally around the world are doing. They can post and share things with you. You can ensure that your children, when they're not with you, uh, have a way to connect with you, and it ensures some safety, right? And so there's an upside to it, too. We're constantly connected. We can check our email. We can check our texts. We can do Facebook. We can send messages. All of these things are very, very true. Constant connection. It's a good picture of what God said through Paul when he said pray continually constant connection pray continually now you can read that verse and misunderstand it if you apply it and go well 
pray continually. Maybe your translation says pray without ceasing or never stop praying. And you're like, man, well, how do I live that out? It's like 24-7, got to talk to God. I guess I must have to become a monk and live in a monastery to do what the Bible says. So, you know, I, I can't do that. I got to pay my bills. So how do you pray continually? How do you constantly have a conversation with God that's ongoing. It's like an English teacher's worst nightmare, right? There's a bunch of commas and semicolons and no periods in the sentence. It's an ongoing dialogue with God. Prayer has been described by some as like breathing. When you inhale, you take in the word of God and the truth, and when you exhale, you breathe out, you're communicating with God what's in your heart and what's in your mind. Let's use that as an example. Did you know that you take roughly 23,000 breaths a day? 23,000. 23,000 times you breathe. That's 23,000 reasons to give thanks. Right? How many do we actually thank God for? Prayer is this incredible gift of connecting God to man and the divine into our world. It doesn't take knowing all the right language and all the right things to say. It's just a constant conversation. When you, when you see something that's really, really good, praise him about it. When you see somebody that has a need, ask him to meet it. Uh, when you see a tragedy that strikes, like I was on the treadmill at the gym this week, and I saw the, the results of the fires in California, and I was like, oh my goodness, I was crying out to God, like, help them, help them, help them. And it doesn't even have to be audible with your words. One man said it this way, it's not in the moving of the lips that the essence of prayer consists. It's in the elevation of the heart to God. It's in the elevation perspective of the heart internally to God. Thanksgiving is so much more than a meal, it's a mindset. And the challenge I would give to us is this, you know, uh, when, because we're constantly connected through these cell phones, right, as soon as something, uh, we're in a large group setting, a public gathering or whatever, and something happens uh, that's pretty cool, or maybe it's, you know, a, a kid's musical or a band concert or whatever it is, or maybe, um, you know, it's a sporting event, everybody grabs their phone, they pull it out, and they start recording it, Right? we got to capture this moment. i got to capture this moment so I can share instantly with everybody that I'm constantly connected to what it is I'm seeing and what it is I'm experiencing. And that's really cool. There's a lot of upside to that, like I said. But what if, I mean, we're really good at that. We're really good at capturing the moment so we can share with the people we're connected with. What if we became better at pulling out of our heart this connection with God to capture the moment? than we even were at pulling out of our pocket our connection with people. What would it look like if we're in the habit of pulling out our connection with God like that? Well, we would receive some of the practical benefits to prayer. Uh, one of those is really timely in our world. Paul told it to the Philippians. He said, hey, listen. Hey, listen, you people that get stressed out at life, people struggling with anxiety, and I'm not saying this is the only answer to anxiety, but listen, he says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with what? Thanksgiving. Present your request to God. Stressed out about the next couple of weeks coming up, all the things you have to do? Maybe you're stressed out because of the people, don't tell them, don't look at them, that you have to be with in the next couple of days. He says, with thanksgiving in your heart, pray. And here's the benefit. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which goes above how I see it, goes beyond where I think it ends, elevates my perspective. Prayer and peace are connected. Peace is a benefit to consistent and constant prayer. Constant prayer cultivates that Thanksgiving living. So if you want to have the right mindset and you want to be a person that has Thanksgiving living and you want to have that character come out of you, it's, it's up to constant joy and constant prayer. And then the third expectation that Paul gave us 
is that we would be pursuing constant gratitude. Constant gratitude. And I found a list this week of things that um, would be moments where we might be tempted to kind of whine and complain, but instead they're opportunities to be thankful. Lists like maybe you have young children and, and you had a chance to sleep in one day past when you normally do, but you have young children and they wouldn't let you do that, right? It can be frustrating. But what a moment and opportunity to thank God that you have children to love. Or maybe you're standing out in the yard and you're trying to rake all of those leaves. I mean, you're like standing in my yard raking all those leaves and you don't even have a tree. And you're like, how did this happen? Why am I raking leaves that are not for my tree? Because I don't have a tree. You could also thank God that you have a house to live in. Or maybe the laundry is piled so high on your house you can't make eye contact with another human right now. And it's overwhelming. You're like, ah. Oh. It's a moment to thank God that you have clothes to wear. Every time that you load or unload the dishwasher or you have to do the dishes by hand at your house, I don't know, you can thank God that you have food to put on those plates. Every time you have to go to the grocery store and spend the money to buy the groceries and make the list, an inconvenient trip and all the traffic and all the people, we can thank God that we have the money to pay for it at the end. When your car breaks down and you have to, have to pay a bill to get it back on the road, we can thank God that we have a vehicle to take us someplace. And then at the end of the day, when you go to bed and you're just absolutely exhausted, you can say, man, I thank God that I have all that to live for, that I'm invested in all those people's lives and I'm involved in all these different opportunities. It's too easy to have a bad attitude about life. Gratitude takes work. Bad attitude doesn't take much work. Just act like everybody else around you. Uh, Denzel Washington said this. He goes, a bad attitude is like a flat tire. You're not going anywhere until you change it. It's true. You're stuck on the side of the road, right? Paul was pretty clear about our attitude and our mindset in verse 18. Look, he said, give thanks in all circumstances. Then he wraps up all three of them and said, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. To rejoice always, pray continually, and to give thanks in all circumstances. What did he mean by giving thanks in all circumstances? He means to give thanks for the individual things that happen in life as they happen, and also the collective whole of our entire life, the orientation of where we're going. He says, give thanks for all of it. Sometimes that's super easy. You know, maybe you look back on where you were last Thanksgiving to, compared to today, and you're like, man, man, I have so many things to thank God for. The people in my lives and the blessings, and I earned this degree, and I got this job, and, you know, we started this, and we paid off this debt, and you're just so thankful, and it's easy. That's great. Do it. And don't take it for granted. Sometimes it's not very easy. Sometimes it's really hard. Because maybe you look back and you're like, man, this has been a terrible year. It's been the worst year of my life. You kind of play back to the old cartoon and with Bart Simpson. Remember the one time he came home and he told his dad, this was the worst day of my life. And his dad was like, well, it's actually just the worst day of your life so far. <laughs> right? It's going to probably get worse. And you're like, I'm there. It's been an awful year, right? The attitude of gratitude isn't dependent on the situation. It's fully dependent, all in, leaning in, in dependence on Jesus. I think we have a problem with being ungrateful, not expressing true gratitude. And if I can speak to a moment to those who are Christ followers, you have a relationship with Jesus, I want to tell you that being ungrateful is the essence of being unsaved. This is a character issue that the Spirit of God develops in us. Why? Because we have the ultimate, the number one top spot reason to be thankful. We know God personally through Jesus. Our sins are forgiven. We have hope. We have no reason to be ungrateful. That's the essence, being grateful is the essence of what it means to have our hearts awakened to being in Christ. And so many of you live like this, and I know you do because it spills out in how you live and how you interact with other people. This is a church that lives out gratitude. 
The countless hours that people invest into ministry in and through this church and for the kingdom of God. The way people people sacrificially give every single week or every single month or all the time to keep the ministry moving forward so that lives can be changed. Here from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Not just so the church can continue. Thank you for following and obeying and being uh, grateful in your relationship with God. Thank you for your trust. We take it seriously. It means the world to us. And so as we walk into a holiday season, here at Grace Church, we traditionally challenge each other at this time of year as it relates to our giving and our generosity and our gratitude. It's called the Greatest Gift Christmas Offering. And what this is is where we decide to go above and beyond what we normally do. We continue to give in our time and our efforts, and we continue to give in our financial support of the ministry. We continue all that, but now we go above and beyond. And we decide to sacrifice for the sake of others to offer them hope, which is the greatest gift that we can give people. And over the years, the return on those investments has been eternal. And we're going to do it again this year. And I kind of want to unveil that project for you right here, right now. And there's three specific areas that your sacrificial above and beyond giving at the Greatest Gift Christmas Offering is going to impact. Okay, three areas. Number one is Africa. Uh, Just a few weeks ago at the Coffee with the Pastors, we celebrated this church's long, decades-long heritage on the continent of Africa. And this year at the Greatest Gift Christmas Offering, we're going to have two very specific opportunities in Africa. One of them is in the Central African Republic. We sent a team over a few years ago, and they saw a need for a well at a seminary training pastors and evangelists there to start churches and spread the gospel. And so we're going to provide clean water for them to drink. The second opportunity relates to a trip that I was on last year when I was able to go to Roro Chad. And to see all of the training that's going on with the the missionaries and the church planners there in a region with five or six different countries around it. And one of those churches right there in Roro has an outreach of compassion to people. And they're able to do this through medicine. And we're going to help support that work in Chad by purchasing some very simple medical supplies that you and I would take for granted that they need. So some of the money is going to go to that. That's Africa. That's our first area of focus. Our second area of focus is going to be a lot closer to home, but not Wayne County. Over the years, we have had the privilege of training young men and women for the ministry, the next generation of leaders, and many of them have gone out and they're in the mission field now, they're starting churches, they're helping start churches, some of them are paid, some of them are unpaid, but they're using the training they received here to further the the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to come alongside a couple of them this year as well. Three Creeks Church in Columbus, which we helped get off the ground last year by our financial contribution at the Greatest Gift Christmas Offering. And then they launched their church, and our middle school students went this summer and spent time encouraging them. We're going to help them again this year. And Main Street Church in Michigan with Pastor Josh Cook. Some of you might remember Josh when he was on staff here years ago. We're going to come alongside of their church and continue to bless and encourage them as well. That's our second area, Africa regionally and then finally number three is locally right here in Wayne County we're going to use the sacrificial giving above and beyond in order to help continue to fund internships so that we continue to send out more people who are planting more churches and carrying the gospel to more places that's a portion of it but we're also going to use it to help uh, the give joy uh, campaign right here in Wayne County last year you might remember the bike Part of that campaign, we were able to purchase bikes for kids here in Wayne County, and the blessing that that was, and how much joy were on the faces of so many different people because of your sacrifice. Africa, regionally, and locally, to make a difference. So I am here to tell you that my family, we're all in with this. Why? Because we have received the greatest gift of all time, which is the hope found in Jesus. And we can't keep that to ourselves. We want to share that with other people. And so we're all in. And I want to invite you and your family to join us. And so I want you to prayerfully consider over the next week or so what your participation will look like. 
I want you to ask God in prayer. God, how do you want me to be involved in the greatest gift Christmas offering? See, when you know Jesus, you know hope. And the greatest gift you could ever give someone is real hope. That's why we exist, to offer the life-changing hope of Christ. So Thanksgiving living is a character, a characteristic that we want to see developed in us. And we cultivate that with constant joy, constant prayer, and constant gratitude. So what if we decided this Thanksgiving season, this week, headed into the beginning of the holiday season, hey, you know what? I'm going to put some, like, some shoes to this. I'm going to put some feet to this. I'm going to carry this message beyond Sunday morning. What would that look like? What does your next step look like? Let me give you a couple options. You can give joy. You can start praying about those five opportunities to, to show joy in a tangible, practical way this season. Or you can give thanks. I read a Harvard psychologist this week that said, hey, if you spend five minutes a day focusing on thankfulness, you can rewire your brain to not be a whiner. That's what he said. Maybe you need to start making a list this week to develop a lifestyle after the holiday. Or maybe you can give hope. You want to participate in the Greatest Gift Christmas Offering. You can just write that on your response card, Greatest Gift Christmas Offering, so we can be praying with you about what God might have you do. Give joy, give thanks, and give hope. Thanksgiving living. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Just a couple minutes before we wrap it up today. You know, we started this series five weeks ago. I asked God, God, please make this a series that is more than just five good talks about prayer. God, make this a series that stirs the heart of Grace Church to pray, to connect with God. And maybe you're listening to this message today and you're not sure you are connected with God. You're not sure how to connect with God. I want to help you answer that right here today. This is your moment God is offering you love, unconditional. Doesn't matter what you've done, who you've known, or where you've been. He's offering you forgiveness that you don't deserve and I don't deserve through his son Jesus and what he did on the cross, dying in your place. And he's offering you hope to start again to start new with him. You're not going to find this joy that we've been speaking about anywhere around you. You're not going to find it in anyone, at anything, at any place, at any time. The only place you're going to find that joy is in Jesus. And he's inviting you to make the connection right here today. And all you need to do is have a conversation with him. It doesn't have to come from your lips, remember? It can come straight from your heart. He's listening. Just tell him, say, God, save me. Thank you for Jesus and giving me forgiveness. Take over the leadership of my life. If you're having that heart conversation with God this morning, as soon as our services are over, I'd encourage you to find the connect room where we have a staff member there ready to have a conversation with you. Encourage you and help you take your next steps. If you're watching online, I would encourage you to email us, write it in your response on your Grace Church app, or make a comment on the Facebook link and let us follow up with you so we can encourage you to help you take those next steps. God, thank you for these last couple of weeks as we've talked about prayer. Thanks for what it's done in my heart, in my soul. And God, I believe in the heart of our church. Continue to stir in us, Lord, the constant connection with you that changes our lives. God, may we be men and women, children, students, who are filled with gratitude 
May we be people who have the character of thanksgiving all through us. God, I believe this weekend we're going to encounter our family and friends that we don't see all the time. Help us show true thanksgiving this week. Thank you for hearing our prayers. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope that this service was just what you needed today. Whether you've been around church your whole life or today was your very first time, we believe that God has something for you and your life. If God revealed the next step for you, would you share that with us? We would love to pray for you. You can share questions or prayer requests through our app or at info at WorcesterGrace.org. This online service was made possible through your generous gifts. If you'd like to contribute to the ministry of Grace Church, text Grace Church Woo to 77977 to begin. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you right back here next week.